I'm, my name is Nick Wigginton. I'm an assistant vice president for research here at University of Michigan. And I'm very excited today to introduce uh, this panel on science and technology policy in the Trump era. Before I do, I just want to get a quick plug in for an upcoming speaker hosted by STPP later this year. Uh, Dr. Wargia Bowman from the University of Arkansas will be here on March 19th to discuss digital development, governance, the state, and information technology in East Africa. Professor Kentaro Toyama from the School of Information will be the discussant, so please do join us for that. Uh, now for today's panel, which is sponsored by STPP, the Rackham Graduate School, and the U of M Office of Research, which we were happy to support today, um, seeing how, it, based on you know, the headlines that keep um, cycling through my phone today, um, <laughs> You know, federal policy around research and science is very important for helping U of M maintain our status as the number one public research university in the country. Um, so we have a wonderful group, group of alumni here with us who can help us understand science and technology policy in today's rapidly evolving political environment. First, we have Dr. Christopher Avery, who is Senior Global Client Assessments Manager at ICF International. Currently, he serves as the Deputy Director of the National Climate Assessment at the U.S. Global Change Research Program. In this role, he has managed the development, writing, and publication process of the NCA and other ongoing sci science assessments. Before this position, he held a number of senior positions both at the National Council for Science and the Environment and the Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office. Previously, he was a AAAS Congressional Fellow, uh, Mer Zion Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Academies. And before that, he earned his master's and PhD in analytical chemistry here at U of M with an STP graduate cer certificate. Our next panelist is Dr. Isha Matthew. Isha is currently a AAAS Fellow in the Department of Defense and previously served on the California Council on Science and Technology Policy in the Office, office of Assembly member Jose Medina, who then retained her as a legislative aide and communications director. In that capacity, she briefed the assembly member on a range of policy issues, including health, transportation, and education. In addition to staffing bills, she also handled communications, including press releases, op-eds, interviews, and outreach. Isha obtained a PhD in cell and molecular biology here at U of M with a STPP graduate certificate. And our final panel, panelist today is Michelle Heinemann. Michelle is a researcher at the Science and Technology Policy Institute, a federally funded research and development center in DC that provides rigorous and objective analysis for the formulation of national science and technology policy, supporting the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and other federal science agencies. Prior to joining STPI, she served as a summer associate at OSTP, addressing policy issues in the environment and energy domain under the Obama administration. Michelle holds a Master's of Public Policy from the University of Michigan with an STPP certificate and a Bachelor's in Chemical Engineering from the University of Alabama. So the way this will work is each of the panelists will give some brief remarks, which will be followed by a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Shobita Partha Sarathi. And she is an associate professor of public policy and women's studies and also director of STPP. Following the panel discussion, we'll take questions from the audience. So beginning around 440, staff, which includes Nikita, which is back there, and Katie, right there. Uh, they'll start collecting cards. And then two students, Pete and Lindsay, in the front row here, along with Professor Joy Rohde, um, will facilitate the, the Q&A session. So make sure to find Katie or Nikita during the talk to get your questions in. And if you're following along online, please uh, post your questions to Twitter using the hashtag policy talks. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to invite our first panelist, Dr. Chris Avery, to the podium. Oh, podium? are you going okay. to the podium or are you hanging out? <laughs> I mean, I was just gonna talk, so. That's fine. <laughs> Make sure you're talking close to the microphone. Oh, oh here, this microphone. Sorry. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, it's very cool to be back in a room that I sat, spent many hours as a student and get a chance to talk to you a little bit. Um, 
Before I begin, uh, I have a couple of things I want to say. One, I, I want to say thank you to uh, the Ford School, STPP, the Office of Research, and Rackham for bring, bringing us back here. Uh, there are a lot of really cool alumni from Michigan doing really cool things, and I don't often think of myself as one of them, but I'm grateful to be, to be back and get a chance to do that. Um, I also want to say right up front, uh, just very clearly set the stage, I am not here representing or on behalf of the US federal <laughs> government. Um, I'm not representing my company, ICF. Uh, I'm here as an alumni. So I'm here to say what I think, personally, me as a human, and I'm not uh, representing any government or, or company. So I want to make that clear. And I'm sure my colleagues will echo something similar. <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit before this panel just to kind of get a sense of, of what each of us were thinking on this particular topic and kind of uh, we each have our own little kind of thought process, I think. But the thing that um, that, that I figured I, I would spend my, my limited time on is just uh, an interesting change that I've seen in DC and kind of the science policy community in the last two years, actually. Not this, I think this started before uh, the current president w was elected. Um, that I, I think I've seen a bit of a change in how science policy is, is treated and thought of uh, broadly speaking, in, in, in the DC world, in the policy world. And, and I guess what I'm really getting toward is um, many of you who've gone through the SDPP coursework have, have heard the phrase honest broker, scientist as an honest broker. And uh, the teachers here, the professors here do a really great job of showing how problematic that particular description is. And all of that is still true. Um, but what I've actually started to see more recently and some of this is colored by my own uh, work in, in the climate science space, is a, a rise in, a, in an actual real version of an honest broker in, as a scientist in a policy space. Um, I don't think anyone here would, would claim that we are in a politically neutral and happy time. Uh, we, are, we are in a p politically contentious time, and uh, that's been going on for long enough that a lot of citizens and a lot of politicians are, are looking for, for places to whatever version they think it is, accomplish something, to, to, to compromise in some way, shape, or form, to do whatever it is that motivated them to be where, they're out, be where they are and do what they're doing. And one of the things that, I, uh, that has come out of that from what I've seen that, that I find unexpected is that science, broadly speaking, and not universally applied, seems to have found a space in this political conflict to be a, a, a safe space for both sides. And I've seen a lot of opportunities where scientists in, in small ways have been able to come in as, as, an, as an honest mediator of fact in between. And I think one of the, one of the, the secrets of success of that particular perspective has actually been around the rise of scientists as a political actor which is a bizarre flip of, of where, where you probably thought I was going with this. But what I think finally happened is a recognition that scientists are human, and therefore we have human natures and pol personal political beliefs. And acknowledging that, and being upfront and honest about that, and trying to articulate, yes, I believe this, however, separate from that, the facts as the scientific community, broadly speaking, understand the world to be is this. And it may or may not align with what I believe, and that's okay either way. But I as a scientist am giving you these facts. Now I as a human and a citizen and a person with values want you to do this. And what I found is that it hasn't necessarily changed outcomes, but what it has done is provide some type of a mental framework for policymakers to understand how scientists can simultaneously be a trusted neutral source and a partisan political actor. And I, and I don't mean partisan in a pejorative sense. I just mean partisan in we all have sides and whatever issue we're talking about that we all come down on. So I think what I've seen so far, and it's, it's, it hasn't been universal and it hasn't been one direction and people have screwed it up, but I've seen a broader understanding of we need to stop pretending that we aren't human and that by acknowledging our own humanity and some of our own biases, we've actually been able to find some areas where we can remove ourselves from the politics. 
which I think has surprised a lot of scientific actors in the, in the DC area. Um, there are probably a ton of examples where someone could, could show that I'm, I'm wrong, but I, I would say the climate space especially, I've seen a really significant value of scientists engaging in the policy space with honesty. You know, I, I think most climate scientists in the world are pretty strong viewed on what they think should happen as a result of the science knowledge. Um, and what I've seen scientists who are successfully engaging in this space in a, with, with people who disagree on the facts or reality of climate change, uh, I, what, what I've seen them effectively engage in that space by doing is saying, the science I've done tells me this. The values that I hold as a citizen of this country tell me that I want you to do this. And that seems like a really narrow separation, but what it really ends up doing is making it very clear that the scientific space around facts and, and understanding of the world, while imperfect and not complete, is a separate space from the actions that our values dictate those facts make us do. So they inform each other, they're connecting each other, but being very explicit about this bifurcation of us as scientists versus us as scientific political actors, I think has actually, I've seen signs that that's actually really helpful. And that could actually, in some ways, uh, be, be a path forward out of some of this um, political anger that we seem to see in the country right now. So that was sort of unformed, but I hope I got to where I was trying to go at the end. So I'll shut up at that point and hand it off. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Isha. Um, just as Chris just said, um, I am here as myself. I do not represent the federal government or anything like that. Um, and I also want to say thank you to everyone involved in bringing us here. So I'm going to talk about something a lot drier but very important to this enterprise, which is research funding. So most of the R&D um, that this country invests in flows through the agencies. And there's two things that Congress needs to do for an agency to function. The first is the appropriations process, where they allocate money to go to different agencies and programs. And the second is the authorization, which gives an agency the legal authority to use those funds. Now, the president himself doesn't um, exactly set the appropriations. He can, however, influence its size and composition. But really what he does is he sends a request to uh, Congress who can accept some of it, all of it, none of it. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, quickly go through that process just to make sure everyone's on the same page with how that, that works. So the president submits his request to Congress. Congress um, uh, uh, has these uh, resolutions um, that sets the, the key point of those resolutions is to set the total uh, discretionary spending amount. Then each house goes through the appropriations process where they mark up these bills, and then they come together and kind of hash it all out. And when they hash it all out, that goes to the president and he signs it, and there you go. Now, as you are all probably aware, when that doesn't happen, there's two things that can follow. One is a government shutdown. Um, and then the other thing that's, you know, not, it's also not ideal is the continuing resolution where funding is capped at a fixed formula. Usually this is at the previous levels um, funding amounts, previous year's funding amounts. It, it's not the greatest, I mean, it's not great. It's, but um, because it introduces uncertainty to the research enterprise, people don't know when the budget is going to come through, and they don't know how much that will be. And so it's t tough to plan for new programs and things like that. Um, when you look at the original, um, the, the administration's budget request, it is lean around R&D funding, except for there's a couple um, cases where that's not true. One is the Smithsonian Institute, which got a bump. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and then a program under HHS, which is like a patient-centered outcomes research uh, fund trust. Um, but however, Congress has a different view on funding levels for you know places like the NSF, the NIH. And so, uh, you know, as this is being worked out in February, the agencies will submit their you know their plans to the Office of Management and Budget for the next fiscal year's plan. So it's kind of two things happening concurrently, but how that's all going to fall out remains to be seen. 
Great. Um, hi, I'm Michelle. Uh, same disclaimers. <laughs> so um, I do not represent my, my organization, the Institute for Defense Analyses, um, or the federal government, my sponsors at OSTP. Um, but also thank you all for, for inviting me and um, these other pa great panelists to, to speak with you today. Um, I was thinking I would focus my kind of introductory remarks on um, how science policy is coordinated at the federal level. Um, and how changing priorities um, at, at that level can um, can impact how science policy uh, is coordinated and gets done. Um, so um, my perspective is mainly focusing on the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is a um, a office within the Executive Office of the President um, that serves to inform the President um, on science. Uh, and technology policy issues that are relevant to the president's agenda um, and policy areas of interest. Um, and one way that the OSTP works to, uh, to advance science policy and coordinate um, science policy among the federal agencies is through the National Science and Technology Council, the NSTC. Um, this is a, a body that um, helps to coordinate the science, tech science technology policy process they help to ensure that um, there is consistency with the president's goals on science and technology policy decisions at the agencies and at different departments. Um, and they also try to help integrate the president's agenda across um, agencies. Um, they also help to ensure that science and technology is considered in the development and implementation of federal priorities. So it's kind of a two-way street. Um, and then finally, they, they also have kind of an international co coordination uh, piece. Um, and so through the NSTC, um, OSTP is, is able to form essentially interagency um, bodies. Um, Chris actually kind of works with one, um, which he will, will likely speak about later. Um, that, that example, the US uh, group on Earth, or G USGCRP is the, the Global Change Research Program. Um, and that example is a, it's, there's 13 different federal agencies that, um, 13, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, um, that, that um, NSTC is able to coordinate to form um, policies around global change, um, climate change being one of the major types of, of change that we see. Um, and so you, you, f there you see uh, these different interagency groups formed around many different um, science areas that are of interest to um, either the president or, or things of, of relevance um, in, the, in the current environment. So, um, or by Congress as well. Um, so for example, um, there's always some lasting ones, like for example, water availability and quality. Um, you also might have some fast track action committees that are set up to maybe deal with Zika or Ebola or, um, or things like that. And so through that mechanism, um, OSTP is able to essentially integrate all of the advice that our thousands of federal um, agencies uh, or agents <laughs> are, are, are providing all of that expertise and really provide the president with um, sound counsel um, and objective um, advice in that area. Um, I will address the elephant in the room. Uh, OSTP currently does not have um, a director. Um, that's definitely something we can talk about and um, later. But um, I, I would say the main changes that you, we've seen or I've, I've witnessed um, in how OSTP and the NSTC process has been coordinated and function um, during this new administration um, is that right now there seems to be kind of a lack of uncertainty, and this comes from the, um, the budget process, but also from a lack of leadership. Um, and due to that uncertainty, um, we're we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of priorities not able to fully um, to to fully function in in the way that the OSTP the NSCC process might um, optimally function, um, and so it's creating you know even more uh, areas of uncertainty in, in those ways as well. Great. Um, thanks uh, to all of you for getting the conversation going. Uh, before we uh, open it up from, to questions from the audience, I had a few. Um, so, and I wanted to start with, right, so you, you've all talked a little bit about uh, what sort of small changes that you've seen 
And, and of course, we are, many of us have a lot of connections to DC and you know, move in and out, and some of us don't, but, but I presume many of us at least read the papers occasionally. And so I think it would be helpful for us to, to get a sense of you know, how, to, how to understand what we read in the papers uh, in the context of science and technology policy. And, and one of the things that I think a lot of us have read, I'm not going to ask you about Russia, don't worry. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I'm that I am interested in thinking about is I think a lot of us have read, especially when it comes to to science and technology policy, but generally in policy, perhaps the place where we've heard about it the most is in the context of the State Department. Is this notion that this, that the administrative state um, is being dismantled, right? Or in Steve Bannon's terms, that the the deconstruction, I think, is the term he used. Uh, that what he was what he was going for was was uh, deconstructing the administrative um, state, and and so we've we've read about that, as I said, most famously in the context of the the State Department, that the State Department is getting rid of, in various ways, um, thousands of employees, certainly hundreds at this stage, and with the designs for more. Um, we know a little bit that that there's talk about similar things. There's been news about that at the EPA. Um, and I guess I have a few questions related to that. The first is, is that a real phenomenon, right? Uh, again, we hear about it at the paper, in the papers, but to what extent is your sense that that's a real phenomenon? Um, and the second question related to that is, you know, what are, if it's a real phenomenon, what does that actually mean? What are the impacts on um, policy, on regulation, on the role of government in our lives? Um, and, and, you know, sort of related to that sort of, you know, how does that affect, does that affect the lives of scientists? Does that a, a affect the lives of citizens in a real way that those, because I think, you know, this administrative state that, that um, is now off more discussed more than ever are often technical workers of some kind, right? They're, they're, they're scientists and engineers often, or I mean, they may be social scientists, but they're scientists and engineers of some kind who are working in the bowels uh, of government um, that are um, that are now being sort of cast into this new light, into this new administration. And I'm curious what your sense of of, of those politics are. Is that is 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 that an, a phenomenon that's occurring? And if it is, what what are the implications of that? And it, it may be different in different places, which I think is also something that, again, we read in the papers, but we don't, you guys are there on the ground, and I think it would be useful for us to get a sense of the specificity and sensitivity of that. <laughs> kids looking at me. Yeah. Um, I'll go next. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, please, start. please go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, sure. So, um, I would definitely say that, so I also read the papers, right? So, so I, I'm also reading the same information that you are, and so of course that is also tainting whether or not I, I believe it's happening, but um, I will say from my personal experience, um, yes, I have seen impacts from that. Um, I'll give an example. Um, you know, we, like I mentioned, in STC, I work often with these NSCC interagency groups, and the State Department, the example you raised, um, often works at or serves on these, these interagency bodies. Um, and when you don't have the right expert in the room, uh, that can be problematic. Um, you're trying to form a, a policy or do a, to come up with a research plan around a very specific issue, and um, and you need that international perspective in the case of the State Department, and there's there's maybe nobody to call, um, and so that that can be hard. Um, I would say the other major impact that I've definitely seen um, personally is the the impact to federal agents' morale. Um, to to um, to my friends, my coworkers, right? And it's 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 disheartening to see um, people feel like they are not valued, that their their careers in science policy serving under um, an agency, um, you know, trying to be a good civil servant and 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 work on issues that they are really passionate about. For that to to not be um, recognized or to be Cut in a way, or, or talked about in in a way um, in the news, uh, is is it affects them personally too. So, yeah, it's definitely impacting more than just the physical person being in the office. I think 
Um, and, and I personally worry about how that's going to impact uh, the next generation of, of people who go into civil service. Um, I really hope that a lot of you in this room are considering going into civil service um, and that you aren't too discouraged by what you're currently uh, might be seeing if you're talking to people who work in science agencies right now. I mean, I, I, I agree. <clears throat> and I, and I, don't, I don't want to draw attention away from the very human impacts. That, that we see in this, I mean, of course, it's, it's real. It's clearly happening. That's that's quite obvious. Um, I, I do think I, I do just just a argument is more interesting. Um, so just just one thing to, to challenge slightly on is that you know the things a staff or broadly speaking a staff of employees works on is reflective of an administration's policies, and it is it is completely appropriate that an administration use staffing as a way to indicate what they do and do not think that it is appropriate for their staff to work on. Um, I'm, not, I'm not defending the choices that are being made, I'm just saying like generally speaking in a very kind of meta way, it's appropriate for a president to come in and say, this stuff isn't a priority and therefore I in my capacity as president am not going to spend the taxpayer money on it. Mm -hmm. You know, every president does that. That's part of part of their explicit job. So that that's n that's not immoral or anything that they're doing doing wrong. We may have complaints about how they're doing it or choices about choices that they're making, but the action in and of itself, I don't think, is is wrong. Um, what it what it means, I think, is a, is broadly speaking, a far more complicated question. And I think Michelle hit the nail on the head of like, yeah, you know, there are all of these kinds of questions about what it means for the future and what it means for the future of the scientific enterprise and science policy enterprise. Whether the, the pipeline of people who want to come in are going to be willing to even work in this kind of a space that um, the the fundamental contract of working in that place has changed. Um, so so those are those are very real questions that, that I don't think anybody really has an answer to. Um, and, I, and I do think that it's also really important to reiterate what you just said of like, this is going to be different in different places. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the impact we see on the State Department is likely to be a lot more significant and long lasting than something like the Department of Energy, where it's really just about research funding. So it'll probably slow down the pace of research, but it won't necessarily change the direction or the content of the research. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it's hard, it's complicated. and. Um, I'm certainly not complimenting the, the process by which it's happening, uh, but I do think that at least on some fundamental level, the, the actions are well within his right. Yeah, I mean, echoing everything you said, my sense, and I don't, you know, I don't have a chart with me to draw <laughs> this conclusion from, but my sense of it is that it's not a broad general loss of staff, it's particular, you know, offices and functions mm -hmm. where this, these changes are happening. And as, as Chris said, Whatever your thoughts on it may be, it is you know indicative of where priorities may or may not be. But the other question is, those people who are doing that work, I mean, they don't just disappear. There's a you know they may go somewhere else to try to do the same functions. And just to draw to that as well, it's not just the people that that, that go on and do other things. The work doesn't disappear either. Yeah, you know, we may choose either not to do it, or we may choose to delegate that work to somebody it else. To another agency. But it, it shifts to another agency yeah. or another place. It may shift mm -hmm. out of government into mm -hmm. another space. Yeah. But it's not like the State Department decided to, to not work on gummy bears, so gummy bears no longer exist. That's a ridiculous example, but that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, yeah. now. <laughs> well, um, so it's like just just because an agency changes their priority does not mean this work disappears into the ether it means that other pathways have to be yeah. found. Mm -hmm. And for people who are passionate about that particular issue they or that particular doing. work, mm -hmm. the way you do that work will change. And sometimes that's scary, but that also is an opportunity. It means that it's a chance to try a new path and do a new thing and go a new way. Mm -hmm. and, and there are benefits to flipping the script and changing the system and trying something new. There are also risks and you can cause a lot of damage, but it's, it's not a universal evil. I mean, just as a small anecdote, I know and end of more than four people who have, you know, faced a situation like that who are now gearing up to run for office. So, just you just never know how that balance is going to be struck. Mm -hmm. So, um, you all are starting to get at some of the complexity that I think is really important, and and hopefully that we can get at um, today. We are in an academic setting, after all, not <laughs> not uh, trying to sell newspapers. Um, but so I, I'm curious. Again, you know, what, what we hear in the papers and what we know about is, you know, all of these 
these scary things that are happening in policy and more specifically science policy. Um, and I'm wondering whether there are places that this administration, wh when you think about the administration's priorities, are there places that are, um, places within science policy um, or within research funding, but broadly, you know, science and technology policy that the, that the administration is interested in or is investing in? And I think broadly, for example, that, you know, obviously this is an administration that has been trying very hard to increase military funding, right? Um, presumably DOD funding is expanding. Um, what opportunities does that create uh, in terms of science and technology policy, in terms of research funding? Do we see other places like that um, within the, the administration's priorities um, where we can say, okay, it is, you know, that kind of embodies this, this complexity that you guys are, are getting at um, that are, you know, sort of actually um, potentially beneficial for certain parts of the world of science and technology and science and technology policy. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can, if you don't mind, no, no, start with that. No. Okay. <laughs> um, so, well, <laughs> so um, kind of, you know, so there's funding and then there's programming, and this example falls more along the latter. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning in my opening remarks that there's appropriations and then there's authorization, right? The legal authority to do things. But sometimes that authorization bill can also signal how um, Congress would like to see an agency kind of lay itself out programmatically. One example of that is the 2007 National Defense Authorization Act. And uh, okay, I'm going to try to explain this. and. I'm going to try to read the room to see how good a job I'm doing with this. <laughs> so you have the Secretary of Defense and you have the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And underneath them are a variety of different offices. Do I need to speak louder? I'm so sorry. Okay. <clears throat> how much did you hear any of that? Use the mic. Oh, oh, it's on. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Much better. So you have the Secretary of Defense and you have the Under Secretary of Defense. And then underneath them are a variety of Under Secretaries of Defense. And there are undersecretaries for policy, there's undersecretaries for the comptroller's office, you know, the financial office. Um, and right now, there is an undersecretary for acquisition, technology, and logistics. And research and engineering falls under that undersecretary office. Now, according to this new authorization act, that research and engineering is going to move up to its own undersecretary level, which means that everything underneath it, from basic research applied, all of that, is going to have you know greater access to leadership and be a little bit more in the spotlight. So that could mean, you know, it's it's it's, it's a big endeavor. It's going to take a little bit of time, but it could mean some interesting things as far as uh, research and engineering go. Yeah. Um, to piggyback off that, that was kind of where I would where I would go with this question too. This administration has um, and. You know, all administrations have, but um, this one has really looked at efficiency um, and, and kind of uh, that's, that is, in a way, it's, it's a good thing. Um, so the reorg of the Department of Defense is a great example of how, um, you know, an agency might use these priorities to streamline and, and um, make, their, make their processes more efficient. Um, within that, we were talking earlier, for example, there's we, there's all the services, each service branch has um, its own, you know, kind of business functional lines. Um, and part of the reorg is to, to also kind of separate those out. Um, so that that also helps streamline um, streamline processes and, and can really help to alleviate some of the issues that large departments that are maybe more bureaucratic um, might be having. Um, that also applies to the other science agencies, not just the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, these can have good impacts. Um, there's also been some emphasis on, or a lot of emphasis on collaboration um, under this administration, be that um, international or be that with academia or the private sector. Um, and I personally think that's a, it's a good thing um, for there to be more collaboration with academia, especially <laughs> in research. Um, and so, so those types of priorities really can um, create 
more efficiencies, and I think that's a, a good thing as well. Yeah, to, to, to kind of jump off that, I think an interesting place to go is to look at uh, confirmation hearings for various mm -hmm. heads of agencies, or um, a lot of them release statements on where their priority issues are, interviews, they give interviews, and you can kind of get a sense of what they're looking at that could be interesting for ST policy. Mm -hmm. One example is the new um, head of, I'm forgetting his name, this is so bad, but the new head of NIST who said some interesting things on looking at tech transfer. What's NIST? Oh, I'm so sorry. You guys are the, not in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I know, and I, I mean, <laughs> Sorry, they just, you get used to it everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's the National Institute for uh, Standards and, tech and tech tech Technology. technology. Yeah. That's right. I always forget the T. Um, so he said some interesting things on tech transfer, and the new um, the person who's been tapped for NCI has said some interesting things NCI about is? National Cancer Institute. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> I know. I know. This is so good. Uh, it was the thing that frustrated me when I started government work, and here I am doing it. Um, has said some interesting things about the role of basic research um, in in science and technology. So I would look there too to see where priorities lie I mean I, I agree obviously with everything they just said and the only other thing sorry the only other thing that I would add is um, I think um, there's an I don't think this I don't know that this is entirely intentional but I do see one uh, ramification of uh, the removal again of, of the federal action from certain science technology spaces is again that work is just going somewhere else mm -hmm. So I'm seeing, I'm personally seeing a rise of a lot of science and technology policy work at the state level mm -hmm. because the federal government is no longer doing it. Um, this may be a dangerous example, but um, the Department of Education, I think, is, is, is an interesting example of that. Um, I'm, I'm certainly no fan of our, of our, our home state secretary, but um, yeah, functionally what's happening is that the Department of Education is just like refusing to do stuff, which is, they're right, that's a policy choice too, but those decisions are just being made elsewhere. They're being made at the state level. They're being made in, in the hands of other people. So what that's doing is increasing the number of venues in which scientists can be useful partners. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not, it, it, yeah, it's complicated. I guess I don't know where else we're going with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully you specified that a little bit, but. Um, I, I think it would be useful actually to get from you a sense of, um, I think we've been sort of talking a little bit, or I've been trying to um, have you guys talk about um, what's changing and what's not changing and what has changed, right? Um, but, but I realized in, the, in, in our conversation, what we haven't explicitly talked about is you know, the relative roles of political staff and mm -hmm. civil servants or, you know, sort of career mm -hmm. staff and, and political staff. And I think there may be people in the room who don't have a, an understanding of, you know, when a new administration comes in, I guess there are two dynamics, right? One is how much of a staff in an agency like the Department of Energy or the State Department or, or the Department of Defense or the EPA, how much of it changes, how much of it stays the same in terms of personnel, right? That's one question. And then how much of it changes, right? So there's the personnel question and then there's the priority question. Mm -hmm. How much of what people do on a day-to-day -day basis changes as a result of those priorities and, and how much is just actually the same between administrations? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start and <laughs> should jump in when I go wrong. Um, it, 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 obviously, this will be a, a common refrain. It, changes by agency. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the bulk of the leadership layer, either at the agency itself or at most of the sub-offices, are political appointees. And they have a shelf life of the administration. Um, so it's, it's very normal that some fairly significant percentage of agencies change when an administration changes. Um, <coughs> civil servants are permanent employees, but they're not in the leadership. By and large, they may be program directors or program managers and, and things like that. But um, most civil servants don't actually have funding authorities or budget authorities. They may be managing projects, but they're not the ones who sign the contracts. Those are largely people who ha occupy a higher space of either um, high-level civil servants or political appointees. Mm -hmm. And that—that's the way it's designed. That's appropriate for it to work that way. Um, and I—I I think that. Uh, the, the second half of your question of like how much does that actually impact the work of the agency um, is that uh, I mean of course it has it, it has it has a real impact but um, the time scale of that impact I think is also quite important okay. you know many of these agencies are working on time scales that are are the length of a whole administration or longer 
you know, depending on some of the investments from DOD. And that changes, uh, th that, that limits the, the amount of impact that change overall can have. I mean, things happen kind of in, in a direction and, and turning that boat entirely can be, can be quite challenging. Um, but I guess the, the, the biggest takeaway that I, that I would say that it changes is actually the process by which things change. When, when, and I'm a little bit biased on this because I saw this happen several times at DOE, so I'm actually really interested to know if you guys agree with me if this is how it works in other agencies. DOE is? Sorry, the Department of Energy. <laughs> okay, it wasn't just me. <laughs> um, um, every time a new secretary came in, um, the, the methods by which things were approved and vetted and considered and chosen and selected at the Department of Energy dramatically changed. And it was reflective of how secretaries prioritize or interpret the priorities that <laughs> their boss, the president, is giving to them. Um, you know, they're coming along with their own expertise and their own interests and things like that, but they're, they're there to execute the president's will. And that changes when the secretary changes. So um, I, I, you know, we, we talk a lot about politics, we talk a lot about policy, and I don't want to lose that third thread of the process. The process by which things happen is equally as important as the other two. And those are things that are, that are actually completely within the control of the administration that are, that are really, really, really impactful. Yeah. Um, I, no, so I totally agree with you on process. That is, at least as from my perspective, it's not uh, from the, the executive office of the president. That also happens there, too. Of course, there, that it would happen there. Um, and how those processes change can really impact how a lot of policy is made. Um, but I would also say that it's not just the administration that's changing. Congress is also always changing. And, and these political appointees mm -hmm. have to be confirmed by Congress. And um, Many and of them, not all of them. Yes, yeah. many of them, not all of them, yes. Um, and as well, Congress can also direct federal agencies to to do things. Um, and so federal agencies are not just, um, you know, given uh, uh, things to work on from the administration, but you know, Congress can also dictate those things as well. So just to add that in the, in the mix. That's actually a really important point that you know. you know, the, the agencies and, and all of the administration have a whole lot of strings attached to their budgets. I mean, have any of you guys ever actually, show of hands, have any of you guys ever actually looked at the budget bill passed by Congress? That's more than I actually expected. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's huge, it's yeah. a massive document, and it's because it's not like Congress just says, okay, Department of Energy, you get 55 bucks, and the State Department, you get 100 bucks and a pile of string. Like, the, the, there's, there's a massive amount of detail underneath. Mm -hmm. There's like an overall appropriation to the agency, mm -hmm. and they explicitly say, this thrust in the agency gets this amount of money, and these sub-offices each get this amount of money. And, and, and then they say, this, this amount of this money will be spent on this, this project or this program, isn't that? So there, it's written into law explicitly what all of these funds are for. Mm -hmm. And there's ob obviously space in there for policy choices and process choices and all that kind of stuff. But m where you spend your money is policy. And a large, significant amount of strings attached to the money that comes in are coming from Congress. Mm -hmm. Nick, you want to ask a question? I'll try to refrain from using acronyms in my <laughs> question. Okay, I want to. You live in Ann Arbor. That, that lowers the likelihood. There you go. <laughs> but I'm in academia where okay. everything's an acronym. That's true, and you are based in Umore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask a question on the politics side of things, maybe in hopes of extracting some juicy insider information <laughs> from you all. So. Um, a year ago, when the new administration was coming into office, one of the predictions maybe that I heard was that things were going to go more from sort of a two-party um, negotiation process between Republicans and Democrats to something that's more um, Congress maybe working together in a Congress versus executive office or administrative sort of negotiation style. And part of that, I guess, is maybe was predicting that we have a unpredictable and maybe uh, administration whose views sometimes change quite rapidly. Um, so I didn't know if, if that's actually coming true or if that's been affecting what you've seen on the ground in terms of how the Congress works with the administration. I, think, I do you get a sense that, I mean, one thing I saw when I was in California is that when, oh, sorry. 
Is that? Why don't you just, that's, that's your mind. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I feel like you don't even need it. <laughs> I'm just loud. That's a good. That's a good skill. I mean, I was just going to say, like, um, w when any party controls a space, there begin to be subgroups within that party. I mean, you, you saw it in California with with the the Democratic Party achieving a supermajority. There are um, groups within that, like the moderate Dems the other Dems, and, <laughs> <laughs> and and they still need, I mean, they still don't agree on everything, and kind of that back and forth needs to happen, and I, I think that there's an element of that going on in Congress as well, that, you know, so it's not just Congress versus the executive branch, it's Congress, 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 and then the executive branch. I mean, I think we have to remember that um, Congress is not this plant that grew in a forest that we all work around now, like, we sent those people there. We, there was, there was an election, you may remember it. And these people were chosen. And there are, whether we like it or not, they are, ref by and large, reflecting the views of the people they're representing. So I, I, I push back a little bit on the idea that Congress is not doing their job. Their job is explicitly to represent the people who sent them there. And, and fundamentally, there are a lot of policy and, and, and political spaces in which there isn't a consensus in our society yet. These, there are some very hard questions that we as a society are, are grappling with. Science policy aside, like mm -hmm. broadly in the more social setting, there are some really complicated questions that we as a society have not resolved. And I think that's also true in the science policy space. And one thing that, part of the reason I open my comments with, with the Honest Broker is that the Thomas Broker discussion was that in spite of that lack of consensus on, on what the right path forward is, or if we even need a path forward, uh, I think that I'm seeing signs of an interest in talking and an interest in basing that conversation on knowledge and facts. And that doesn't premeditate a particular outcome, but I think that there's at least an interest in talking again. And some of that some of that is going to be frustrating because it doesn't mean that everyone is going to agree at the end of talking. You know? Um, so I, I don't know if that's a juicy juicy okay, tidbit for you. I can't but resist anymore. Who who want, who's interested in talking? <laughs> we'll give you a great example. Um, there's a new caucus that has popped up in Congress, the, the Chemistry Caucus. It's ah. a bipartisan caucus, and it's actually talking about uh, increasing some regulations at, at the EPA about disclosure of chemicals and chemical safety mm -hmm. for for citizens. And and there are there are, it doesn't mean they're going to do anything. I really don't think they will. But <laughs> but the fact that they're having a conversation in a safe space is meaningful. You know, so th that's one example. And I'm seeing other places where I'm seeing green nonprofits partnering with an oil company to have a conversation about how that oil company can use less fossil fuels to make as much money. And oil companies were not open to these conversations 20 years ago. And it's not that they're changing their business. It's not that we're changing any actions. But a predicate to any, any kind of, of change or advancement is discussion. And we haven't, I personally, th personally, not representing the federal government, <laughs> I personally think that part of the reason that there's so much angst and anger right now is that we have shut ourselves off from having the real conversations to actually get to the next step of solving a problem. We aren't even in agreement on what the problem is yet. That, yeah. So until we can get to some kind of a space where we can at least agree what the problem is, or at least agree on pieces of the problem, we're never going to get to any kind of actual change. And I don't think anyone, regardless of, of their political stripes, is happy with the way the world is as it is now. So have at least having some amount of discussion of ways they want to, to do something different or change the world in whatever way you think is best, that starts with some safe space for conversation. And I've at least seen an interest in having the safe space. So that, that caucus is just, is just kind of one example that I'm coming off the top of my head, but I'm seeing others too. Yeah, that and that right there, what Chris just said, is sometimes the hardest part of getting to any solution. Getting people in a room to have a discussion is such a, I think, undervalued part Absolutely. of the process. Most, I think most politicians are very afraid of the idea of going in and having a conversation and saying, I don't know, because I'm going to be held to these statements, and I can't learn. 
I can't just have a conversation and figure out what it is that I don't know. And I and I'll, and. I actually, the thing that actually gives me a lot of hope in that space was the, the 2016, uh, 20, well, I don't know what year, what, 2017 election uh, in the state level in Virginia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of the people, uh, and I saw this on the Republican side too, and the Republic, some of the Republican delegates who won, were saying, you know, I don't actually know what I think on every single issue. Tell me what you, citizen, tell me what, rep- what you, person I'm asking to represent, think. Help educate me so that I represent you well. That is, that, I challenge you to go try and find that being said in, a, in, a, in an election 10 years ago. So th- there is change, but it's, it's happening at a, at, a, at a conversational level that doesn't rise to kind of the political coverage that we tend to see. Mm-hmm. Okay, questions? questions? So the first question is, how does public opinion influence the science policy process, and how do policymakers balance expert opinions with public priorities, which may be skewed by so-called fake news? Can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, yeah I kind of need to write down some pieces of this. <laughs> how does public opinion influence the science policy process, and how do policymakers balance expert opinions with public priorities that might be skewed by fake news? Well, that's not a one-word answer. Yeah. Anybody want to try first? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as you might imagine, I'm not short on opinions. Um, <laughs> I really hate the term fake news. I really do, and probably not for the reason that you think. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> fake news has become an excuse to dismiss things with which you disagree. And I think that that's something that we in the scientific space need to really fight against. You know, I see this, I see this a lot in the climate change space, you know, where people who are labeled as climate change deniers are dismissed as not welcome to be a part of the conversation. And I think that's really sad. I think that's really a shame. Um, so just starting out in that space, I hate that term, so I'm going to ignore it. Um, but to actually get to your question, um, I think that question was phrased in a way that I just kind of want to disagree with. Is that I think it's not, I, I think we need to stop yelling at politicians for listening to public opinion that is quite their explicitly their job. Their job is there to represent us as the citizens of this country. And there are limited ways in which, seven, in California, in which 700,000 people can talk to one person. <laughs> There are limited ways in doing that. And surveys, uh, while imperfect and criticizable all across the board, are one way in which an elected official is trying to understand what the person, the people that they represent, think. So I think it's really, really unfair of us to criticize politicians for listening to their constituents. Um, That said, I think it is a fundamental challenge that people in political offices have to grapple with of when they want to consider technical knowledge when it stands in opposition to what their constituents think. And I'm really, this, this is, that grappling is a large part of why I probably don't really want to run for office. Because that's a really hard question. It's a really hard question, and it changes from minute to minute. It changes, you know, the, the way that you weigh those things changes based on your own personal values and your own lived experience. And I don't really, I don't have a great answer for how they do it because I don't know how I would do it if I was in their job. I think it's, I think, on, I honestly think that piece is the hardest part about running for office. Do you have an example that you might be able to share that sort of, t- that kind of brings that grappling into, because I think for, Again, in, a, in an academic space, sure. Um, for us, often it's hard for us to imagine if you have technical knowledge that provides you with insights. You know, we often are in a position where we say that should be the overriding um, uh, basis for a decision. Sure. So when I was working in Congress for Senator Coons, um, there was a debate I watched on the on the House floor, or not the House floor, on the Senate floor. Uh, and I thought it was really, really interesting, and it stuck with me because um, Senator Whitehouse was making a speech in favor of doing something on climate change, as he does quite regularly, uh, which is great. I'm happy for it. Um, 
And another senator stood up and said, you know, I'm not dismissing the science behind what you're saying, but you're asking me to take money out of our current budget and invest it in a future 100 years from now that we don't know what it's going to look like. And there are children who are homeless in my district, in my state, who are starving. And quite frankly, I would rather spend this money on that. Now, you can criticize, I have a lot of, of responses to that particular comment, but I thought it was actually pretty insightful because what it, what it shows was a different prioritization of now versus later. And you, you can have, there are all sorts of criticisms that you can make of that, but I think it's a coherent policy position to say the federal government should focus on feeding and clothing its citizens. So to me, that's one example. Um, can I try to, so maybe we can, just, in case the question was supposed to be asked or could be, there's another way we could address this question. It's just not the congressional It's story. true. I went to a different um, place. So, but, but in case that was what the person was <laughs> asking, maybe we could also talk about that. that please. Time. Yeah, please. Um, so public or citizens can also, I, I guess, uh, have a say um, in science policy, not through their elected representative. Well, however, that is a great way to, um, to influence science policy. But there's also things like requests for information, RFIs, on policy documents that are currently being developed. For example, um, the organization that I work for works on a lot of these policy documents, and we put out RFIs all the time. Um, and we ask for public input on, or, you know, or expert input on, on what we're, what we're working on, um, that science policy um, process. Um, and there's also, of course, public comment periods and, and other, tons of other examples of public comments. Um, but it doesn't, so, my answer is it doesn't just have to be through an elected representative. You, as um, a, a citizen with an opinion or with some some really relevant bit of scientific information that you feel like needs to be included in some sort of process, you can submit that information. There are forms and processes to collect that, and every every comment is read. Mm -hmm. um, it is it is the job. So, for example, um, we did an RFI a couple right, months and ago, and to. I was the one who received all those comments, sorted them, mm -hmm. and wrote a summary of them, right? So, um, this is on a very specific, very small document, so it wasn't too many. It was only like 60. Um, but so, so there's other ways. It doesn't just have to be through the elected representative. I don't know if you guys want to comment on that as well from the agencies you work with. Yeah, no. I mean, agencies, whenever yeah. they're doing regulations, have a public comment period. So Not just regulations, reports and Reports, stuff. yeah. 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 The yeah. National yeah. Climate yeah. Assessment yeah. is out yep. for public comment right now, everybody. Yeah. Review.globalchange.gov. <laughs> Go tell us what you think. We want to hear it. And um, yeah. I just wanted to make one small, quick comment about public opinion um, influencing science and science policy. This has not gone unnoticed, obviously, by um, the agencies to, I forget the name of the report, but in the, in the National Science Foundation's, um, <laughs> I think it was their indicators report, um, not only they collect all these different metrics, but now I believe that they have a new line on what makes a metric a good metric. And I think that's because they understand that, I mean, just this, forget fake news. There's just so much information out there. And how do you add value to what you're putting out that people grab onto it? I mean, this is a, this is a very big question. I would also just add, if you're, reading the, if you're reading the news fairly regularly, that's great. You're a fairly informed person. How many of you have ever checked the Federal Register? How many of you have ever heard of the Federal Register? Okay. The Federal Register is a publication that the government puts out every single day that summarizes every action that is in the public space. Every single day, almost every single week, I would imagine, there's something released where the government is explicitly asking for your input with directions on how to give it. And it is like pulling teeth to get people in the public to actually comment and participate. We are desperately wanting it. Do it. We mean it when we ask for it. So, like federalregister.gov, you should you should have that on your list of things you read on a periodic basis. All right. Next question. Um, so, can, you guys have kind of spoken on this a little bit, but I think we want to dive a little bit deeper. Um, so, considering the present political climate, where partisan divide on issues keeps growing, and there seems to be even more animosity than ever in between the right and the left, how do we and people in DC escape the danger of being in an echo chamber, where we're only talking to one side and we only choose to have the conversations with the people who share our beliefs. How can we kind of break that down? And how have you seen that happen within your own experience? I don't want to keep talking first. <laughs> I was just thinking about local politics. Yeah, that's what I was going to go. That's yeah, where I was going to go. Uh, my sense was 
pay a lot of attention to local politics. It's smaller. People there tend to draw from a broader base of what they have in common. Um, I think there's, like, yeah, I'm just going to stop there. I guess I would, I would, I would add on to that and, and <laughs> say that, um, uh, honestly, the, the only person who's ever changed my mind is someone that I knew. You know, and it's, it's uh, that's not entirely true. I'm being a little facetious, but it, it, the, there's a lot of power in this. In hey, you person that I trust, think differently than I do. Let's talk. Um, so I, I would say that I don't see any way out of a a deeply separated political divide other than people at the local level talking to people with whom they disagree and having conversations that may or may not change people's minds. You know, um, I think that there are a, a lot of examples in the political zeitgeist where uh, we've seen significant movement in, in public opinion that only came up from the citizen level. Like, I, I just think it's, I think it's delusional, not delusional is an unfair word that's a little aggressive. Um, I, think, I think it's unreasonable to expect Congress to fix a deeply felt partisan political divide in the citizenry of the United States. You know, um, we have to save ourselves. So um, if you're only reading, if you're a liberal and you're only reading Huffington Post, shame on you. If you're a conservative and you're only reading Fox News, shame on you. You know, I, I, I don't think anyone would be surprised for me to say out loud I am a liberal. Um, I, there are, I'm, I'm a subscriber to three libertarian magazines. I don't always agree with what's in them, but I find their thinking fascinating. And I learn from them. You know, so it's, uh, you, you have to seek out thinkers and, and human beings with whom you disagree and talk to them. Mm -hmm. you know, we can't expect everyone to come to us. We have to choose to fix it ourselves. I'll, I'll echo that just a little bit. I really think these, these conversations that, that Isha and Chris mentioned, they're hard to have. Um, and, and starting with family is always a good place. Um, but also reading is, is a really, really great way and educating yourself on the other side's opinions or the way that they might approach something. What, what are their values? And really trying to, to do that research and confront with that and think about that. Even if you don't put yourself out there and have those conversations, I think at a minimum being aware um, whether that's listening to a podcast that's maybe a little libertarian leaning for 10 minutes a day <laughs> just to get that perspective. Um, just keeping, just not always siloing yourself is just so important. Um, and also not doubling down on your opinions. It's something I've definitely learned um, in DC, you know, like really being open to hearing other people's opinions and, um, and you know, when they might have a, an opinion that, that goes against a fact that you believe in, just recognizing that and leaving it there. So I'm going to take the moderator's privilege to, <laughs> to, to chime in on this question. Having, having had all three of these uh, illustrious alumni in my class, uh, and in a class um, that really uh, attempts to force people to do this, and so I think it's, you know, I think that their responses are correct and wonderful, but I think the thing that I would add to it is that you have to really understand the logics in the positions that you violently disagree with. Um, if those are positions that have legs, then there's a logic to them. Uh, and there are, there are uh, facts that are associated with that position and there's a style of reasoning and there's a set of values and in the class that I'm I uh, where I have these all three of them you know I force students to role play stakeholders and I encourage them to role play stakeholders that they vigorously disagree with because that's another place where uh, you can understand that logic I begin to understand that logic as a means of trying to start to bridge these dis divides. I think we are now at a moment where we caricature other people um, from different political perspectives so much that we reject the idea that they're people at all. Um, and we certainly reject the idea that their positions might be evidence-based. So we will say, well, you know, their facts are wrong. <coughs> they're, you know, they're monsters. Well, you know, that it's, it's, I think in real political debate, that's rarely actually the case. 
Um, and I think you are a better political actor and you're more likely to get what you want um, if, you're, uh, uh, if, you, if you really embody and try to understand the logics. You know, one small thing, a little kind of a flip to that. Um, so where I work, I meet a lot of people who think a little bit differently than me. And one thing I found very interesting is finding an issue that we both actually agree on and understanding what led them to reach the same decision that I did is often not the same. And kind of having insight into that is also really, really helpful for these discussions as well on issues where you differ. We have a question both from Twitter and the audience. They're both uh, kind of together. Um, as people with scientific expertise, how do you handle or have you handled in the past situations where your superiors might make statements or have positions that diverge from a scientific consensus regarding, for instance, climate change or vaccinations or things like that? Um, and would an honest broker of science um, simply say that these are divergent views on these topics, or would they advocate for a particular position? <laughs> no, please. <laughs> OK. Um, so I think virtually every, I, I, I told you guys I did a congressional fellowship uh, in, from the American Chemical Society in 2011 and 2012, and there's a group of about 40 scientists who get uh, compete and get placed in Congress to do this every year. And in every single one of those interview processes, this exact question is part of the interview panel. Um, because it's a fact of life. You know, it's, um, unless you're the President of the United States, there's somebody that is above you. And even then, the citizens are above him. So it's like, no one, no one doesn't have a boss. And no one doesn't have somebody else who has other some other value system or perspective or structure that they're that they're using and um, the reality is is that science alone is not the yeah. only answer to every question you know science is I say this as a scientist a scientist is the mechanism that we as a society use to mediate factual disputes it tells you what is good joy is smiling because she's the one who actually gave me this line um, <laughs> um, it's it's, it's how we, we know that the sky is blue or that eating carrots is good for your eyesight or that climate change is occurring. But politics is how we mediate values disputes. Politics is why you, how we decide that we're going to incentivize eating carrots in, in elementary schools because they're good for you or, or whether when we decide whether or not we want to do something about climate change. That's a political and values choice. It's not a scientific question. So one of the hardest things, I think, personally, about being a scientist working in the science policy space is knowing my place mm -hmm. and knowing my limit. And there are decisions that get made that are informed by the science but are not only informed mm -hmm. by the science. And sometimes values outweigh it. A lot of times values can outweigh facts. That's the nature of us as human beings. It doesn't make it evil. It doesn't make it wrong. It just is. So uh, knowing your place, I think, is is one of the hardest parts of being humble and being part of this this community uh, is that you can't fix everything, you can't change everything, and just because somebody did something that is in opposition to a fact or scientific knowledge doesn't mean they're wrong. I mean, that's, that's hard to swallow. That's the thing about being an advisor, though, right? It Absolutely. doesn't obligate the person listening to you to take your advice. There it's you just there to inform all the other streams of evidence that go into their decision making. Our jobs as advisors is to make sure that the person making the decision is as well armed yes. and well informed as yep. possible. The decision is theirs. It's theirs. To make. Mm -hmm. If you want to be the person making that decision, you need to run for their office. Um, and my, where I work, uh, the, the way that we always like to talk about it is, you know, we do objective um, policy analysis um, for, you know, either the White House Office of, Tech, Office of Science and Technology Policy, I'm not using the acronym, or other federal agencies. Um, and not just in the Trump era, but forever. Um, if we do a, a research study and we hand it to our sponsor and they say, well, it's not the answer I was looking for. That's not what I wanted to hear. We say, well, that's what our that's what our analysis gave us, and you are welcome to throw that in the trash. But this is the answer that that we have. 
you know, and, and they don't they don't have to to take it, do anything with it. They can put it in a way in a filing cabinet and never look at it again. And we'll be sad because we worked really hard on it and, and we really believe in it and we, we, we feel like it's it's objective and it's, it's our best attempt at you know, providing them with a rigorous a rigorous analysis. But they don't have to do anything with it at the end of the day if they don't want to. So that's and that's that's I think a good thing. That's how the process is set up to, to run, so that they can take in all of these different pieces of advice that they're they're receiving and um, and make the, the decision that's best for their agency or their constituents or whoever they might be. For those of you who attended a lecture, I think it was last semester, um, Shabita, when she released her, her most recent book, you know, one of the themes and takeaways that I hope all of you who attended that took away from it was that there's more types of experts than just scientific experts. There's a vast array of expertise that's beyond just technical science. And we expect the people who who we have chosen to lead our, our society to take all kinds of expertise into into account, not just our own. That's really hard to do. It's really it's hard to do. It's a really hard thing to do. Okay, so in the wake of the uncertainties in the federal level with the way things are structured right now, do you guys expect to see greater participation from state government, local government, nonprofits, like citizen science movements and things like that? Have you already seen that and do you expect it to continue? Yeah, I mean from a research funding level there's been some there's been big increases at the state level. Um, I think most of it driven by five states, but um, still but the only issue only regarding funding, this my comment is limited to funding only, is that even with different sectors stepping up, especially with high risk, long term projects, th that needs not just a budget, but a consistent budget. And I think the last time, the last numbers I looked at were, were that the state contribution combined was like 1% of the federal investment in that sector. So it's, it's, it's a tough thing to do. But I still think it's interesting to see where compensation happens. And, and I would say you, you'll, you'll see it happen in, in different sectors um, first. I mean, there, there are some um, state-level agencies that function much better as a state type of agency. For example, the Department of Transportation is probably more effective at the state and local level than it is at the federal level. Um, and there's, there's many examples like that. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for state and local jurisdictions to really fill the space that is perceived to be being left right now. That goes back to what we said at the beginning of like decisions are made somewhere. Um, so so yeah, I do think that there's there's a rise of opportunity. I think um, I think this is pretty gross, but I think for a number of decades even uh, there was a perception that um, the, there's a lower quality of worker at the state level, and I think that that's totally false. It's completely false. I think that there's a lot of really, really gratifying work at the state or local level. And quite frankly, the federal government is really largely about um, funding and rules around funding. I mean, there, there's other things too, but the bulk of policy at the federal level is kind of pretty intimately connected to those two things. Mm -hmm. And the state and local level is about putting <coughs> steel in the ground. You know, one of the coolest projects that I ever got the chance to work on at the Department of Energy was actually, uh, wasn't at the Department of Energy, it was at the city of, De city of Detroit. I got to come home to my home city and work with Mayor Duggan in Detroit to retrofit all of the streetlights to LEDs. I don't know if you guys have followed that news at all. I was part of that, I got to be a part of that. And it wasn't because the federal government like solved the problem, it was that the federal government came in as a productive partner and said, you state locality, state or location, city, city government, what do you want? We have expertise that we can help you figure out what you want if you don't know, and we can help you lead it. I think to me that's kind of the future of, of effective uh, state and national and local interactions, mm -hmm. of trying to um, give localities the space and breathing room to decide what's best for them, and then using federal resources, whatever they may be, to solve the problems as they've framed them. Yeah. And I think that um, for, I, I have seen, that does give me a lot of hope that I've seen kind of some productive movement into that space of, of stopping this, we at the national government must know what's right, and instead of saying, you, this person who lives in this town, tell me what you need. Yeah. And that's definitely something that, that it's um, just always, I'm constantly being reminded of no matter what the science policy topic of the day I'm, I'm looking at, um, is that you know, the federal government can only do so much in a, in, a, in a certain science space. It's 
lot of times it really comes down to, to municipalities or, or local um, governing bodies or authorities and those types of things that are really um, actually doing the work and creating the incentives, building the, the plants or whatever. Um, and the federal government can really just kind of set up that framework. Um, and you know, and, and that's really useful. It enables a lot of states and, and localities to, to do things that maybe they wouldn't have been able to do. Um, but still, that, a lot of stuff. <laughs> it, it, it blows my mind whenever we're working on things like, oh, this is technically out of scope because the federal government just doesn't have space here, right? And so um, I'm constantly being reminded of that as well. I mean, and that's how it should be too, right? Like, uh, yes. I mean, if you're trying to reduce this, let's just say that the U.S. government put out some goal on, I don't know, greenhouse gases, and then the state of California interprets that a certain way, and one of the programs in that is mass transit. The way that's going to look in Fresno is going to be very different than the way to look in San Diego, very different than the way to look in Humboldt County. So it's really important to have that level of local interpretation and implement implementation on those activities. Can I, this at the risk of, mm -hmm. of you all acting like, or uh, assuming that uh, decentralization of science and technology policy is the way to go, which maybe it is. But I think, I guess I would be interested in your reflecting on if, if science and technology policy retreats from the federal level um, and goes either to the state and local level, to private actors, um, what, what do we lose? What are the kinds of things um, that, that either, what are the kinds of priorities that get lost? What are the kinds of projects that get lost? Um, uh, if this is a kind of trend, which is you know everything should be local, uh, uh, what are what are the drawbacks of that? So I'm going to complain just for one second about a word you used that it's retreating from the federal level. I okay. don't believe that that's accurate. No, I'm. I think I think that I think that the science and technology policy operations at the federal level are well staffed yeah. and are and are, are are going to survive regardless of who who is in office or when or what party or whatever you think. Um, what I the way and I'd be actually really interested to know if you guys agree with me, but to me it, it comes off much more as a democratization of science and technology yeah. policy, of that not only have we built infrastructure and interest and expectation of science policy at the federal level, we now have an opportunity to show its value to the state and local level. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I don't think I don't think I think the normal Indiana citizen would assume that everyone at the federal level understands why science is important. But I think if you asked them why science policy or science itself is important to their small town, they would be hard pressed to answer that question. And I think the removal of, of science and technical knowledge and science policy writ large into the state and local space is an opportunity to more deeply connect the scientific enterprise to the, the actual lived lives of the citizens. Yeah, I hope my, I mean, uh, my example is just an example. I hope I wasn't making an argument for, you know, retreat and decentralization, but linking to what Chris said, just a way to engage as many communities as possible into an overall goal setting process for this work. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Twitter that's sort of a follow up to a variety of the comments that have been made so far. Um, that so far this panel has sort of taken the position, it seems, that doing science policy really hasn't fundamentally changed under the Trump administration. Is that a correct understanding? <laughs> I mean, I mean we, all gave, we all talked about that, that under any administration, things change. Under any different Congress, things change. Um, but, and of course, there are different differing priorities. I mean, you can compare the, the, the OSTP priorities memo that came out in 2017 to um, the last one that came out from the Obama administration, and you'll see they're actually really similar. And um, certain sentences might actually be the same. Um, and, and so while there might be large areas of, of shifting focus, um, it's, it's not as dramatic, I think, as the news would like to would like to make it seem like it is. I mean, I remember we we got calls, you know, th th there's all these stories about um, the Office of Science within OSTP is empty, and that means OSTP is no longer in existence. Like, that's not true. That, you know, it's just, there are still people <laughs> there. Um, you know, so it has definitely changed, but it should have changed, and it, you know, and it did. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that, and then maybe we'll pick back up. And well, I'll just say you know, that 
I seem to be challenging the premise of questions a lot today. <laughs> um, I, the, fundamental to that question is an assumption that the science and technology, the science, bleh, the science and technology policy enterprise is static. And that's just not true. And I, I hope that that's yeah, at least we something. We didn't have AI projects. Yeah, five years I hope that, ago, I hope that that's at least did, something right? that we've like Sorry, communicated here. Is just like <laughs> 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 LEDs, light emitting diodes. I got yelled at for that. Um, the problem is you're going to go back to DC and start spelling out all. The <laughs> you're like, why are you talking so much? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So, what LEDs are. so uh, sit situation normal of science policy is evolution. It is change. You know, I, I don't care who won the White House this time around. Science policy should have changed yeah. from, from one administration to the next. Science policy changed from the first Obama term to the second Obama term. That's yeah. how it's supposed to work. We change the society, and especially in our understanding of how science and technology impacts our daily lives. That's changing at a much more rapid rate, I think, than it was for my parents, and certainly more than it was for their parents. Mm -hmm. Change is our new normal, and we have to stop being afraid of that. Yep, I'm just literally going to echo what you said, right? I mean, science changes, tech changes, societies change, um, and priorities of leadership change. And I mean, all these comments from today are focused on science and technology policy under the current, yeah. OK, well, we're at 5.30, so we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up. So um, please join me in thanking our speakers.